Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Duncan Ogilvy, and uh, I'm here to talk about uh, X64 DBG. Um, so, quickly about me um, I'm 20 years old, student in computer science, and I have no qualifications whatsoever. So, I was quite surprised when I saw that my talk was accepted here, to be honest. Um, so, about X64 DBG. Um, it's an, the official line is an open source x64 x32 debugger for Windows. It started in May 2013 and basically it came out of a need for a 64-bit debugger on Windows and it was greatly inspired by OliDBG, as you will see soon. Uh, I wrote it in C++ because that was the only language I knew at the time, so that's why. Now, there's um, various uh, alternatives to X64 DBG. You see them listed here, but, well, basically, um, none of those fit my requirements. So, instead, I decided to uh, roll my own and, uh, yeah, see how that went out. How that worked out, sorry. So before I start talking about x64 dbg itself, uh, just a quick refresher on uh, x86 assembly because that's what we'll be looking at for the coming time. And after that, I'll give a quick overview of how Windows debugging works uh, internally. So um, x86 assembly, it's pretty simple. If you don't think about it too much, you have a few registers. Um, a few of those are special registers that um, point to the current instruction uh, to the top of the stack, and you have a flags register. Then there's memory, um, in which there's instructions that your uh, process will execute. And yeah, there's a stack uh, which is pointed to by the stack uh, pointer. So, quick examples of x86 instructions. Uh, the first one, it copies the value of RBX and REX. Should be, if you're familiar, it's probably very tedious, but yeah, this is how it works. Uh, notice the swapped operand order. Um, yeah, this is for all the instructions. So, at RBX, RCX will add the value of RCX in the RBX register and not the other way around. Um, you have push and pop, which push and pop um, values or values to the stack and adjust the stack pointer accordingly. There's a call, which will change the instruction pointer to a function and also push the instruction of the next, the address of the next instruction on the stack so you can uh, return later with the return instruction. And then there's various uh, jump instructions which allow you to implement loops, uh, if statements, and yeah, so you can basically have a program with these. Now, um, over to Windows debugging essentials. So it starts with um, this green line here, you create a new process with a debug flag, and then you enter the debug loop, which waits for an event, then dispatches the event magically, and once that's done, you continue the debug loop, and, well, the cycle goes on until the process is terminated, which is indicated by the red arrow. Now, obviously, all the interesting stuff of a debugger happens in how this events, various events are handled. So here's a few uh, things that have to be done in there. So you have some basic housekeeping for uh, processes uh, created under, your, under the application you're debugging, uh, threads that are created and closed, and modules that are loaded. Those all give debug events, and you have to just store some information in some data structures so you can use this to debug stuff. Uh, then there's exceptions. So if you do something wrong, 
the processor will uh, just say something's wrong and throw an exception. Now the whole purpose of the debugger is to intercept those so you can interact with your uh, with your program in the crash state so you can find bugs or fix bugs. And exceptions are also used to uh, generate breakpoints. So you just insert uh, an instruction somewhere that, that you know will crash always. And when the instruction pointer gets there, it will say, hey, there's an exception. And you can handle the breakpoint. So you can break the process and inspect the state or something like this. Then there's the trap flag, which you can set. And this will generate an exception on the next instruction executed. And you can repeat this process. Uh, it's also called tracing. So you can just step through your program and inspect the state. Um, yeah, do whatever you want, basically. And there's debug output, which, is, which allows the pro process you're debugging to communicate with the debugger. And it's, yeah, you can use it as a programmer to basically have a debug log. Now, um, back to x64dbg. Uh, my philosophy, at least I think it's my philosophy, is uh, that it should be simple. So everybody should be able to just open the debugger and go debug. Um, another thing is that it should work on the reality and not assumptions. So various debugger, uh, they make various assumptions about uh, functions or something like this. And x64dbg can do this, but per default, you just get the state. It shows the state. Um, I also try to not reinvent the wheel because there's great libraries out there and uh, re rewriting them just takes up a lot of time and it's basically pointless, in most cases anyway. And then I think you should be nice to the user, so the people who are using your debugger should have fun and not struggle with just basic things. They should be just able to debug. Now the architecture of the debugger, it's very simple. You have, um, in the middle, you have a bridge. And this bridge basically relays messages from the debugger, which is the core of the debugger. It handles all these debug events. And it will relay them to the graphical user interface, where they can be displayed and you can interact with them. And then when you want to actually, for example, step, the graphical user interface will tell the bridge, OK, I want to step now, and the bridge will tell the debugger. And uh, this way, in theory, it's possible to replace either of the debugger or the graphical user interface. So in theory, it's possible to create a fully headless uh, version of x64dbg. But in practice, of course, uh, it works quite differently because development is not always smooth and this interface is pretty tedious to program in, so you work around it and, well, this would give you problems if you try to replace it. But it still creates a nice separation between the debugging core and the user interaction. So you could also choose, for example, to just work on user interaction and just not ignore the debugging core. So this is uh, great for productivity. Now, just a few libraries that x64dbg uses. The first is Qt, which is the graphical user interface. Um, it's a great library, and since x64dbg is GPL, it's compatible. Um, it's great for productivity, so that's why I decided to use Qt. Then there's Titan Engine, which is, uh, this handles the debugging uh, internals, like these debug events, they're abstracted by Titan Engine to uh, yeah, create better abstractions and eventually also allow this module to be replaced. Then there's dbg help, which is the famous, I guess, not really, it's a terrible library from Microsoft that allows you to load uh, Microsoft's proprietary debug symbols, which is quite useful if you want to load symbols. Um, 
Well, there's Capstone for disassembling, and probably some of you heard of it. Um, well, there's Janssen and LZ4 for uh, database stuff, and um, Setparse and Keystone for uh, assembling new instructions. Then there's also Yara, it's integrated, pretty much. So that's also a library uh, I use. Now, um, I just want to give a quick demo and show some of the basics of x64 dbg so you can you have an idea what I talk about. Um. Oh, well. Um. That's just great. Um. Right, so this is visible, sort of? Yeah, so this will do. Right, so I just uh, loaded the debugger in the debugger which is always interesting. Um, so on the left here you have uh, the disassembly view. This just shows you the instructions that are, yeah, currently the, the black instruction is like the one that will be executed next. So the um, RIP points there. Then on the right here is the registers view which just shows you all the registers and all the basic registers and also flags uh, and various uh, X87 floating point registers. Um, in the bottom here, you have a small window that shows you information about the currently selected instruction. So, for instance, it shows that this keyword that's referenced inside this instruction is not a valid pointer, and the value of RBX is also shown. And it also shows the current location in the program, which is quite useful at times. Now here's the dump window. It's uh, pretty basic. You just have your basic uh, hex dump with some text. Uh, there's various floating point options, integer options. Pretty basic. Uh, just what you would expect. Uh, here's the stack. Sorry about the resolution by the way but it's, yeah, it's like this. So uh, it's just the basic stack. Uh, this black pointer is the RSP. And here is a small widget for arguments. It helps you basically with um, interpreting what's happening. So I'll just uh, do a few single steps. I'm currently single stepping through um, anti DOL, oh, kernel 32 actually. Um, you have breakpoints, so you can uh, break here. Just the basic things you'd expect from a debugger. Now there's also symbols, uh, call stack, a memory map, all kinds of things. Um, so yeah, this is basically what you're looking at. And you might wonder how will this help you with analyzing stuff? Well, that's a whole different story, but this is the debugger I'm talking about, which I just wanted to show you real quick. Right, so developing a debugger is not easy. It's not always fun, unfortunately. And these are just a few challenges uh, I came across, just anecdotes basically about the development, which this talk is about. So one interesting thing is bug reports. They're very nice, but if you cannot reproduce um, a blocking crash on your computer and the person reporting the bug gets more and more frustrated about that you cannot do anything about it, this is um, very interesting, very interesting experience. Um, now there's a lot of, there were a lot of bugs with threading, which is, pretty hard. There's like five threads running to make sure your interface doesn't lag behind. 
and some of these race conditions are very challenging to debug because I don't have any good tools to do it. So you just fiddle around until you think, oh, wait. And then you find a nice to do item, fixed threading in your source code where you were supposed to fix it. Now, another interesting thing, thing for um, building uh, continuous integration, I um, basically rented the server at this company called Cloud at Cost. Um, it's a very interesting uh, company. And my server kept shutting down while building. Makes no sense. So I thought, well, I'll go on Twitter to ask. And everybody was like, yeah, you should read the terms of service. Well, I already did. But they changed them. And according to them, abusive, activ abusive activity is 30 minutes of CPU time which is very weird because it's just a normal build process. Um, and I checked and indeed, um, according to them, I'm responsible for frequently reviewing this agreement posted on Clouded Coast website to obtain timely notice of any such changes, which is pretty hilarious. And frankly, illegal in Europe as far as I'm aware, but I'm no lawyer, so I don't know. Now another very interesting uh, challenge is the fact that there's all the libraries that I use are open source, which means I've, if there's a problem, I can just check the source code, except for the Microsoft's DBG help library, which is very interesting. So at one point, uh, I got a bug report that said, yeah, if I try to start this process, it will take at least 30 seconds until it's loaded. So eventually, I pinned it down to a function in DBG help. And it turned out that it pointed to a symbol file on a network share. So it tried, on my computer, it tried to find this share, which obviously didn't exist. And this is undocumented, so that's great. I had to dig through the source, I mean, through the disassembly of DBG help to figure out what to do about it. Turned out there was an option, but documentation said it did something else. So it's. Uh, very interesting challenge. Right, so a few numbers. What are we talking about here? Uh, it's been downloaded about 158,000 times on SourceForge. So that's pretty nice, I guess. It says that a lot of people are using it. Although I don't know who those people are. So contact me if you ever use it and yeah, tell me what your experience was. So there's a few other. Uh, interesting things. Uh, it's currently 113,000 zero. I cannot read numbers, but it's a lot of lines of code. It was a lot of work. And the amazing amount of 1,490 US dollars was raised. So thanks to all the donors. It's really great to have you. Right. So x64dbg is built for reversing. So what do I mean by that? Well, um, there's various small things built in to ease you as the user. Um, there's an imports rebuilder built in. It's um, basically a fork of Scylla, which is a great imports rebuilder for Windows. So if you if ever, ever need to dump a process or rebuild some imports, it's right there. It's built in. Um, yeah, there's a simple notepad built in, which might be useful if you are very chaotic like me and you're too lazy to manage your notes. It's just right there in the database. Now, frequently there's just a few small anti-debug tricks that are done by the process to check and there's simple countermeasures built in. So these are not proof, foolproof, but they do the basics. So most things get hidden pretty well. You can copy data very easily in various formats. So you can copy some data to a C style array or to some unsigned long array or something like this. And you can very easily patch executables. It's um, you change the memory, you hit patch, save to file, and it's done. So that's pretty useful if you're uh, trying to patch something. Unlike IDA where it used to be pretty hard, I think, but I don't cannot afford an IDA license, so I wouldn't know. 
There's also a feature which we took from Verdere. Uh, I hope I pronounced it correctly. Uh, and that's the mnemonic brief, which gives you a very brief description of what the instruction does. And this can be very useful, especially if you have to check which type of conditional jump, uh, which flags it will use. Um, and there's also a very um, hidden but useful feature that's help and symbolic name, which will just Google any label or basically any label or reference address that has a name. It will Google it for you and, well, hopefully it finds something useful. Now, there's obviously there's breakpoints built in and uh, there's some sort of tracing built in. It's not like fully functional yet because it's pretty difficult to get working. But there's conditional breakpoints, so you can just uh, specify your condition. There's also logging built in and logging conditions, so you can break on certain conditions, break and lock on other conditions. And you can also execute commands, which might not seem very useful, but because it's only one at the moment, but with one command you can just call whatever C++ you want, so you can do anything you want with breakpoints, basically. And there's um, pretty simple conditional tracing, so just step until EAX equals to zero, and then it will stop. This can be useful, for example, if you just need to find a spot where where you know something's going to happen, but you cannot really know where it is exactly. I will sh show something in the demo. Right, so there's plugins like OliDBG, those that had beloved plugins. Um, most of those plugins fi fix bugs. Uh, in x64 DBG, these plugins should, in theory, do stuff. Um, so the philosophy is keep it very simple. Again, um, it works on a very basic event subscription model. So you say, I want events. If the debugger pauses, give me an event, and the debugger will give you events when the debugger pauses. So you can, for example, log this somewhere on a disk or just resume debugging to screw with the user. Now, there's also um, x64 dbg pi, which is sort of a pun, but not really. Um, it's a plugin. So I have basically nothing to do with it, except that I have commit rights to the repository, but I, I'm not really involved. I don't use Python, so yeah. Uh, it's written by Thomas Zaid. I hope it pronounced correctly. I don't know. And yeah, it's it's f fully implemented as a plugin. So there's a few. Um, I added a few API functions uh, that he needed, but apart from that, it's uh, yeah, it's a, it's a plugin. There's nothing, no trickery involved. And you can pretty easily write your own Ruby plugin or PHP plugin if you're crazy or something like this. Now there's also Yara built in. I mentioned it briefly, and that's the pattern matching Swiss knife for malware reversers, according to the official website. Um, and it's integrated, so you can uh, load a signature, check if there's any matches in various regions, and also you can check the file directly if you want. So you're not restricted to just memory or just the file. You can also, in a dynamic state, just use Yara on it, and maybe after you unpack something, maybe you find something else interesting. And this is uh, integrated as a simple command, and for that command, I created a simple user interface. So it's very minimal. It doesn't, doesn't require much effort at all. Now, there's also decompiler built in, um, which I didn't write again. Uh, I just took the source code, I did some modifications, and just plunged it in there, basically. That's how, how I did it. And I made the various changes to make it look a little better, but, uh, and you can move around from the decompiler to the disassembly view, so you can um, inspect the decompiled source directly. And it's very loosely integrated, so there's only like uh, one, I believe, no, two, two functions that are called, and you can also very easily replace this with, for example, nothing if you don't like a uh, decompiler. You can just uh, be like, I don't want it. 
And now I'm going to give a small demo, or at least try, um, that involves Python with Z3, which is a constraint satisfaction library, I believe. Uh, and it also involves Yara and Snowman. Right. So, um, on the abstract, it said there would be um, a demo on a real life scenario. Well, that didn't quite work out for various reasons. Um, but I wrote a small crack me instead, which should be pretty interesting as well. So, let's first, um, let's see. Um, Right, so this is simple correct me. Uh, you just open it, it says enter key. Very basic, of course, it's just to show the features. Um, so you enter a random number or something and it will crash. Presumably because it was programmed very badly and it will crash if you enter a, an invalid code. Right, so this is the entry point of the executable, which is visible here. Um, and I can just uh, search for strings, which is always a very um, easy approach if you are just starting. And luckily, I mean, it doesn't really matter, but uh, there's re some references. Right. This is pretty small. Maybe this is better. So here we can see that this crack me, it um, uh, calls printf to print this enter key message and then it calls scanf to get a key of the type long long hex. So we need to enter a long long hex number and it's a loop so it will just um, ask keys until, it, until you enter the valid hex number basically. Right, so let's run this. I, um, I can use a run until selection, for example. It's one of these features that's pretty useful if you're just, if you just want to quickly go somewhere. And it will ask for a key. So uh, just uh, one, one, two, three, 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 four, four, five, five, six. Something like this. This is a very basic key. Now we break. Um, pretty straightforward. And the key is somewhere inside. Yeah, where is it? Here. As you can see, it, this is, the key is referenced by this instruction inside this memory address. And it will move, um, it will move this key in uh, RCX, which on x86 is the first argument of a function. So it will put this key in a function, presumably to check it or something. Right? So I go inside this function and Let's just quickly analyze it. Analyze single function so you get like nice boundaries. And let's decompile it. So, decompile the function. So, what this does, I didn't invent this myself, but it's a very uh, interesting crack me. It basically multiplies RCX, which is the key, by, by itself seven times. So you get effectively you get RCX to the power of seven, except that it will be cut on 64 bits. So you cannot take the square root of this number uh, because you wouldn't end up with a valid value. So for this, we have uh, constraint solvers, which should be available somewhere around here. Right. So I wrote the script. And, um, oh. Right, so it does exactly what this decompiled function does. It creates a bit factor, which is basically a fixed integer um, of 64 bits, and it tries to find a valid key. Right, so I can run this script like outside of a debugger, but I mean, that's not even remotely interesting. So I just will run it from inside the debugger. So it should output a key in a few. Uh, Seconds, right. So the constraint uh, solver 
magic found a key, which is in decimal, but that's not a problem because there's a very handy calculator built in where you can just input basically anything and it will give you the equivalent in different bases and stuff like this. So the valid key is this. At least that's what I assume. I mean I didn't make this crack me or anything. Just just an assumption. So there was something else interesting going on, which was the fact that the it crashed when it was invalid. So we'll take a look at that real quick. Um, so let's just uh, run it and see what happens. Right, so it crashed uh, with an exception on 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and all the registers are zeros. So I cannot look at the stack or something to figure out what's going on or where it came from or where it crashed. I mean, so I will have to try again. Right, so the entry breakpoint again, and the string reference to this key again. So let's just um, put it here, run here, and f just enter an invalid key just for fun. And so now I'm here, and eventually it will crash, but I don't know where, and I don't want to figure out by manually tracing in. So that's why there's conditional tracing. Um, you just Trace until condition, and which was like rex equals zero. And wait, did I type three x? One, two, no. Okay, um, rbx equals zero, and say I don't know um, rcx equals zero. So I just trace. Um, I have no idea what's going on now. It's still a demo. All right, so we're here, and this looks like some it's not a module because it doesn't say that's a module here. Well you cannot see that real well. Well it's not inside a module. So let's just check um the return address. Right in the stack it says return to correct me something so that's probably interesting. Follow it like again basic things you don't have to manually type addresses at least it's horrible to type um 16 number addresses by hand without errors. Um, so basically it went somewhere here in inside RBX. And it looks like it did something with a buffer, but it's yeah, so this is basically why you would trace, would want to trace with a condition because you can find stuff like this. Um, but we already have a valid key, so it's rather pointless. I believe it's on my clipboard, yeah. So we can just um, restart, oops, um, run. Right, so break here. Enter the valid key instead. Enter. Right, so now it will, uh, this function checks the, is checking the, uh, the value if it's correct. And notice how it just went back to the previous location there with minus, so you don't have to remember everything. Um, so just, this should pass, right? So we just step over here. And this function, well, it does something. I have no idea what, but we're gonna try to use Yara on it because Yara is good for detecting things. And let's see if Yara can find something. So I just go to the symbols, which is also a modules window, and I just do uh, Yara on file. And I have some uh, crypto signatures here, some packers, some compiler signatures. So let's just uh, try to find some crypto. Oh well, it found some MD5 constants. So apparently this function is MD5. So we know that we just use Yara and it's uh, pretty easy. Um, right, so this does something with an MD5, some, something with buffers. It's pretty, um, pretty vague. If you, if you want to inspect it in depth, I can post this crack me somewhere. Um, and it prints congratulations because we did it. We, defeated the magical algorithm to uh, to a crack me. 
So that's a small demo. It's obviously quite canned because, um, yeah, I wrote the Kraken myself, so I know everything. But tell me if you Krakenize crack me. I will, uh, I will love to hear the story. Um, so back to my slides. Right, so that was the demo. I hope it showed a little bit what like Python can do. I mean, there's also integration with that you can actually debug stuff, but I couldn't find a good example, so I just showed this. Um, everything is open source. Uh, you can always ask me if you need uh, some information. Right, so there's also other plugins. How am I on time, by the way? I don't know. There's also a few other plugins. Um, so if you need more advanced uh, debugger hiding, there's Scylla Hide, which is written by some uh, very skilled people. They know how to write hooks, and I don't really, so it's a plugin. And it's for, yeah, prevent uh, anti, I mean, prevent anti debugging, so it's anti anti debugging. And recently there was a tool. I mean, yeah, a tool was released called Alt Caser, um, which was aimed at testing if your malware environment was um, basically safe or undetected. So, um, yeah, um, you have to take it from me now because I don't have a lot of time, but it, it works. So, everything is green, and without Scylla Hide, it's red. So, they did a great job writing that. Um, so about the UI, you can customize everything. Most people dislike the default color scheme. I like it, but you can change everything pretty much. Um, yeah, you can also style your windows, which is built into Qt, but I mean, I don't use it, but you can, so it's great. And the interface is fully translatable. So uh, the translation has been up for about, I think, a month now. And Russian, Chinese, and German, and Italian are pretty close to being translated. So uh, that's great from the community. They're great people. Um, yeah, there's also an entropy graph built in. Um, and there's full Unicode support, which is very vague, but basically, you can have full Unicode support, but per default it's not because it's very slow to draw. Um, and optimizing the UI is very hard, especially because Qt has internal caches that are really hard to figure out without going in their source code. So you can, but it will be pretty slow if you try to do some high performance stuff. So per default it's disabled, but you have like you can go to all code pages, you can view any language um, if you want. Now, uh, various people of the community, uh, the x64dbg community that is, are watching. You guys are amazing. Thanks. Um, just wanted to say that. Um, And I'm out of time. So ask me that if you have questions. Yeah, I have like more content. I can talk more. It's like, uh, but I don't know. I think they would be all right. So I have some more content, but um, you can ask me, um, Twitter me. You can find me on the internet. It's not so hard. Um, just go to, uh, let's see, here, this website. It will show you ways to contribute, how you can come in contact, and that's about it. Uh, any questions? No questions? All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. I, I have to admit that uh, you